Hello and welcome to the Donahue Group. We're happy that you're joining us again for a fun-filled half hour of political <laughs> chatter and, uh, and uh, delightful insights into the wonderful state of affairs in our, our localities, our state, not so much the nation. That would probably take a good hour, but I'm joined today as always by Cal Potter, former state right. senator, Tom Paneski, Glad to be Professor here. of Mathematics at the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan, Ken Risto, the king of social studies <laughs> in the Sheboygan Area School District. Me. Just like the king of England, uh, completely ceremonial. Just <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Queen of and the me, I'm president. Mary Lynn Donahue, after Queen. whom this Queen. show Queen. is named. Queen. Zarina. <laughs> Thank you. The Zarina, long live the Zarina. <laughs> Finally getting just a tiny bit of the respect to which I'm entitled. <laughs> um, we're talking about state affairs and boy, it's been interesting lately, not so much in what the state has been doing, our wonderful legislators. Which and, is not much of anything. Yeah, they haven't been, but what people are thinking about, and I'm going to just take a half a second to read from the Journal Sentinel on Sunday, <clears throat> a poll that uh, came out with a lot of interesting information. This is the most interesting thing to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. The poll asked those who were uh, polled um, whose interests elected officials represented the most, voters' interest, special interest, or the elected officials' interest. Lots of S's there. Only 6%, 6, <laughs> not 16, not 60, but only 6% thought that their elected officials represented the voters' best interest. 41% thought they were representing special interests, and 48% thought that uh, politicians, elected officials, were representing the elected officials' interests. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty stunning number. That kind of tends to put politicians below lawyers. Car salesmen. Car salesmen and other assorted ne'er-do-wells uh, <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the world, 6% thought that elected officials were representing the voters' interests. Yeah. What do well, you think? Well, I think this is a, a low ranking that they've earned. Um, <laughs> I, well, there you go. I always you say go. you get the government. Mer you, merit pay. You mm -hmm. get the government you deserve, and I think people have uh, tended to ignore that we need a new financing system for our government. And as campaigns have become more and more expensive, we've seen people who have gone out and gotten in trouble, particularly in the Madison scene, uh, shaking down people for money. Uh, we see it on a federal level and uh, indictments of people who have done cozy and illegal things with uh, the financing of campaigns. Uh, I can't help but think people would draw uh, a conclusion that either they're out for their own hides, protect their own hides, or they're out there serving a special interest who wrote the check. And I would agree that uh, the system has got its flaws, and but people ought to start thinking about what the solution is. And in my opinion, the solution is to get big money out of campaigns. But uh, it's, it's, it's something that has evolved to be a system that is broken, I think. If you bring it down to numbers, uh, let's see, 6%, uh, there's, that'd be about one council member <laughs> would be for the voters and the rest of the council members are for themselves or special interests. And where do you put the mayor in that? Is he for the, uh, his own self or the special interests or is he for the city? You probably get one or two voters, 6% of what, 17, 18 elected officials. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think there's a problem. <laughs> you know, but, but Americans have never liked legislatures a whole lot. I mean, can anybody name a Congress that was esteemed you know, in public opinion polls? You got that, and secondly, you've got a whole industry of talk radio, that which, ex to, which exists, general. yeah, which sure. exists to to sure. generate that discussion. I mean, you can't talk about, you can't get on the air and say, let's talk about how good government is lately, and how they're providing us with services that we need. Who wants to listen to that? Yeah. It's not not nearly sexy enough. Well, the media do it. The public, the, the national media, and the state media, all the media like yeah. to trash people. Sure, not just. Talk radio. Well, I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but, I mean, you've got you've got talk radio, and then you've got talk television, and you've got you know, as Bruce Springsteen said, fifty-seven channels and nothing on. That's right. So you got to fill those channels with something, and it's got to be twenty-four hours. What are you gonna, what are you going to talk about? And so whether you talk about Hardball by Chris Matthews, you got the whole personification of, of politics, and and politicians become celebrities and na national and state. Yeah, you got you got certainly that, and you got the yeah the reality of raising raising funds. Um, 
I wouldn't even want to think about running for public office as much as I'm interested in current Well, there, affairs. bingo. I don't now. want to raise funds. I don't yeah. want to stand around prostituting myself, quite frankly. One of the, I, mean, I think it's incumbent on people who are interested in the political process to try to recruit people to run mm -hmm. for whatever office, whether it's school board or city council or state legislature, and even at a very local level where you don't really have to raise a whole lot of money. I mean, you can run a good school board race for, you know, five or six hundred dollars. Uh, I mean, it depends, but you know, you can do it for for just that. The, the, the disrespect, and it's not even the disrespect, it's the distaste, I think, that people have for being in the public eye is so intense that it's very difficult mm -hmm. to get good people to run for anything. Mm -hmm. Three of the four of us have been local elected officials or state elected officials, but it's tough. Sure. You know, you're, if you're out trying to recruit people, I know when, when I left the school board, I was just intent on, on, on trying to find somebody who would run in my place. And, and I did, but boy, it took a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the school board was pretty calm and still is, but yeah. I mean, those were fairly calm times. I left, left things in such good shape, but you know, it, it really, it, I don't know, it was just the 6% that you really, really hit me. You're that. really buffing up your resume these last couple of, <laughs> these couple of episodes. I can't imagine, I can't wonder if I'm thinking if you're thinking about contemplating a run for something. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Are you going to make no. an announcement here in the air? And, you know, I keep batting this microphone, and I'm, I'm sure I'm... But our driving producers poor eye. Yeah, and I think that's been, part of it too is the culture has gotten a lot less civil, and so it when, is you're in, when you're in public in, serving... Um, the culture is also less, sure. I think... A political in the sense that, yeah, Americans have never loved their public officials. They've always had a distrust ever since yeah. King George, I guess. But, you know, one of the things about uh, the public today is they are a product less of public discourse on issues. In other words, if you look at this, I always, when I was in Madison, I always tell the kids to look at this beautiful Capitol building and just ask yourself, do you think the taxpayers today would build a building with these mosaics and all this original art and this gold leaf, um, no, the answer is no. Well, they but put it was, a hut. But they probably would. And, but what happened at that time is you had immigrants and sons and daughters of immigrants who had a great deal of pride in their new government, in their new home. Mm -hmm. And they felt uh, they wanted to house it in a distinct uh, building that was fitting of the concept of democracy. Today, people are a product of sports, consumerism, um, just a culture that's not so much attuned to coming to this country because of political freedom or seeking mm -hmm. a better economic mm -hmm. life. They're just, they're on a different wavelength. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm noticing that as I get older, I guess, that the value system differs, differs as you get older. And there are a lot of young people today who don't care about politics or politicians. It just doesn't fit in their whole cultural milieu that they, that they live in. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it, 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 interestingly enough, and, and our Wisconsin Academy group has, has talked one evening about third party politics in the U.S. and how really literally impossible it is for a third party candidate to get elected these days to mm -hmm. any big office. But there's an interesting movement going on right now in Wisconsin, the, the Fighting Bob Party. Uh, it's not a party, but it's the, their motto is, is this a private fighter, can anyone join? But um, kind of coming out of the fighting Bob La Follette tradition, and we've talked a little bit about it, but they had their people's legislature in, I think, Baraboo, and I mm -hmm. believe this is the fourth year they've done it. And each year, more and more people come. I think they had about 5,300 people this year, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, and these are the folks that convene the people's legislature. Which uh, is meeting tomorrow, I believe, is it not? In Madison? Um, on Thursday, October 27th, uh, they're doing a clean okay, sweep. Uh, yeah. They're doing a little, they're Bring fun, they're a fun, they're a fun group. That's the Wisconsin democracy campaign, but they're, okay. and, and, but they're, and they're really talking democracy and they're equal opportunity hitters. I mean, they'll go after Doyle as much as they'll go after mm -hmm. guard. In fact, they seem to enjoy going after mm -hmm. Doyle more than, than, than the Republicans. But, um, there is at least a body of people who are thinking and trying to re-engage with, with the real political process, which just has to segue into governing. Because you, you become a politician so that you can become a legislator and you can do good things. You know? Doesn't New York State have 
umpteen political parties. They have the Conservative Party. They have some other kind of party. The they have the party, Re Liberal know. Party. Yeah. They have the Republican. Democrat. They have about four, five or six parties. Mm -hmm. And candidates always try to get the endorsement. Republican, Democratic candidates try to get the endorsement either the Conservative Party or the Liberal Party. So there's already a model out there for, yeah. for you know. But I'm thinking the, that these the fighting, yeah, these fighting Bob folks are pretty active. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's certainly a small group when you t take it in the vast cosmos of Wisconsin politics. Sure. But they're lively. They're fun. Um, the internet allows them to communicate with people in ways that you mm -hmm. know the, all these folks have their blogs, and and and, and so it, it is pretty interesting to me that if you have six percent who are happy with where things are going, maybe this is fertile ground for the growth of, of alternative views. Which leads me into um, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, which actually has online since mm, 1996, I believe, a record of all campaign contributions from all state elected officials um, right there. I mean, if you want to see who Jim Baumgart got money from, or Cal Potter, or Joe Leibham, or you just click on, and boy, it's right there, and it's, it's an interesting database. But they're a pretty lively group, I think. But they're going after Doyle, um, considering him a politician in the Tommy Thompson model, which is get as much money as you can out of people. I think Doyle's got some problems. I, I personally really like Jim Doyle, and I think he's done a good job. Uh, and he's been, his veto pen, I think, has been for people who are progressive thinkers, has been pretty important. Um, but he's got trouble uh, on this poll. Only 40% think that the state of Wisconsin is going in the right direction. 51% thought it was on the wrong track. The pollsters say this is the highest negative we've ever received on that question, even though I think Doyle is generally fairly well regarded. Now he's got his own travel gate matters. I don't know. What do you think? I think the mud that drips off of Tom DeLay and Bill Frisk and uh, oh. George Bush. <laughs> okay, and, throw it out. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I think all politicians uh, are suffering, um, and I don't think Doyle is is. I, I would not put him in the same uh, category as. Tom DeLay. Although I did like Tom DeLay's mugshot. I thought he looked positively, <laughs> positively My point is that, that the, the Burks and the Koalas yeah. and, and anybody who's gotten in any trouble and the council and people in Milwaukee yeah, guard, yeah, and okay. the recalls that they had, yeah, and, you yeah. know, I think it's muddied the water so much that people, uh, as I said before, who are uh, really a basically formed by their consumerism, their sports culture, and their entertainment culture, say a pox on all their houses. Uh, and, they, and so I don't know that push comes to shove when, when Doyle is up for re-election, whether you know, he's got to fight this, but I'm not so sure that okay. uh, people examine the records closely and people who really know uh, the individuals involved yeah. would come down with the same numbers. I think this is a generalized, again, politician, anti-politician, uh, Viewpoint. What's interesting, again, is the same numbers can be brought for people's confidence in Congress. It's like 29%. But when you go back to their districts and say, well, now what do you think of Congressman Petri or Sensenbrenner? All of a sudden, the numbers are way up. Way there. up they yeah. love their congressperson, but they hate the institution. institution. Yeah. And so yeah. I think yeah, in this case. schools as well. They love yeah. their local neighborhood schools when you get right down to yeah. it. But when you ask about public schools, they're a shambles and we yeah. should destroy them all. Yeah. Yeah. So no I think police, some, of, uh, some of Doyle's numbers are yeah. a result of they don't like politicians. But I'm not so sure push comes to shove that he's going to be viewed any worse than Green or whatever, whoever opponent ends up being his, his I mean, I, I mean, opposition. On the record, and Tom, feel free to you know, jabber back no, at me, no, but no. I think Doyle's done a nice job. He um, survived. Well, he's, he's brought in a, a balanced budget. Uh, he has certainly supported public education. Well, I, okay, you know, he borrows from the, the left pocket to pay the right pocket. Sort of like robbing the entire tobacco settlement. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I mean, do that. Uh, you sure, know, for I pennies agree. on the dollar, I think. Yeah, that I, was a Democratic legislature. No, me, I, I think thought. that was Scott McCallum <laughs> was Kuala, who did that. I mean. Yeah, well, in any <laughs> in event. Any yeah. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, you take from transportation to pay, you know. Take from tobacco to pay, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I think, I think it, some of the negatives that uh, brought down delay and maybe bring down delay. Are, are, I think the Republicans will use against uh, 
Doyle in the, in the contribution list that you just alluded to. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's that serious because I do believe that the, what the governor has said is that he's known the Edelman family for years. I have known the Edelman. Lynn Edelman served mm -hmm. as, in the legislature. He's now a federal judge. That family has been politically active for a long time. Forever. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, I don't think it's unusual to have had contributions coming from someone um, like that family. I, I think if you you look at uh, where Doyle has got his money, it's like any other politician. When you don't have public financing, they go out and raise it from whoever's mm -hmm. got money. And I think Tommy Thompson was a master at it. And I think uh, the, Doyle has learned well from the only The only thing that raises an issue in my mind is that the history of Edelman, or whatever the gentleman's name is, and his, was that he contributed at most $1,000 to any political campaign, whether it was Doyle's or any campaign. And within this time period of pre and post contracts for the travel agency, two people, himself and another person, contributed twenty thousand dollars well, to the Doyle's campaign. So it looks fishy from that viewpoint. Well, but it may be legit, but yeah, it looks fishy. And I think fishy. that's that's the point. You know, I know that there's study after study that says you there's really it's hard to prove that those kind of contributions actually in the final analysis really make a difference in the kinds of laws the legislatures make. But I never it just looks bad, sure. and it always looks corrupt, even when it isn't corrupt, Correct. and who knows? And then, you know, whether it be the Democratic Party in the 1980s who controlled the wheels of power in Washington and in Madison, and the Republican Party, you spend that much time raising funds and getting cozy with people, it gives, if nothing else, the appearance of impropriety. And that, in a culture that you're talking about, where, where the media is going to pick up on that and play that and spin that as, as being corrupt or not, you know, it just is going to make people mm -hmm. extremely cynical about um, about politicians and their intent. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think the public's outrage against politicians has to take a step forward to say, all right, right let's put some uh, rules in here that make sense. Yeah. Like, for example, no contributions during a legislative session, only during the period of the campaign. There are things you can do either without mm -hmm. public financing even mm -hmm. that would make a lot more sense and probably give people a better right. confidence that there isn't somebody yeah, on the take here. Right. Uh, I, I know Jim Doyle personally, and he's a, he's a very, very uh, good politician. He's full of integrity. I have He's a confidence. very decent person. He's a decent person. Yeah. And I, I think this is a matter of timing. I think if you go back and you look you look at the state, the state is always entering into contracts. We do business with mm -hmm. people who do laundry. We do people who do road work. Um, you know, SBC does contracts for the phone service. And I think if you go back to Tommy Thompson's years, you probably find executives from SBC who have given uh, money to Tommy Thompson while well, their company had a, a contract with the state for phone service. And you could probably draw all kinds of conclusions if you wanted to from, from that type of, of uh, interaction. But the fact of the matter is government doesn't provide all the services. It does contract with sure. the private sector. And people who are in the private sector do give to politicians. And so that's the bad part about the whole uh, public, to me, private corporations and so on being involved in campaigns. And if people don't want to change that to public financing, then we have to do another thing, and that is control when those, those contributions are made. And we don't want to seemingly want to do that either. I know. So it's, I know. it's really a dilemma that it's in people's hands to start asking and expecting these changes, but they don't take the next step. And I, I attribute it to, I guess, the fact that they just are so apolitical, have stepped back so much from their previous uh, generations that that's, nobody says has a sense of urgency to fix it. Well, see, I, I don't have it, you know, you mentioned Edelman, the company. They, I figured they'd select them because they're Wisconsin. I mean, homegrown, give it yeah. to the agency if it was close. Well, there was a thing on but, Channel 4 the other night about Doyle driving in an SUV, a General Motors SUV made in Janesville. And they were saying, well, doesn't this guzzle gas? Well, he said, I'd buy it because it's the only vehicle that's made they by a Wisconsin, Wisconsin company. I mean, that's yeah. why I'm using this vehicle. <clears throat> but, but I'm thinking also, I mean, Republicans and Cheney get the slam bastard for Halliburton, but Halliburton can do a lot of things that other oil companies can't do, and they know what well, they, they can, can do. Well, they can sure make money, and they <laughs> and they know how to do how to and they do know how to do, do how it. to make money. They do how to do oil work successfully, not give it to somebody who's going to screw it up. Well, there's a can of fish for you, but I, I just thought I'd throw that out. To... <laughs> I thought I'd ask Professor Risto here just for a little for a little historical perspective. You know, we can be in real despair. I mean, 6% to me mm -hmm. is a despairing kind of yeah. number. Depressing. Yeah, and as much as I like the Fighting Bob people, it's 5,300 people, not 53,000 or 500. Not 5.3 million as yeah, it is in the state. Exactly. A small percentage. 
Things have been worse in American history, right? Oh, in yeah. Terms of Congress is, I mean, you go to the Gilded Age and go back about 100, you know, 1880s, 1890s, I mean, it was the progressive movement. Yeah, it was Civil War. Unbelievably, <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievably corrupt. I mean, And uh, the progressive movement grew out of that. Part of, part of that, the progressive movement was the, the real feeling that government no longer was responsive to average people and that, you know, the United States Senate was nothing more than a, you know, a millionaire's club or a, a formal lobby of the industrial uh, Is our forces. current Congress as bad as the Gilded Age Congress? In my view? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. But, you know, but I, I want to step back. So where is and, the progressive but, party I, coming? I, you know, part of it's that, but part of it is, is that I think as a society, we're just deeply split about some really fundamental issues in our history. And so when I see the Congress being extremely partisan, um, so I want to separate that. There's certain things that the, the Congress is extremely partisan about, and I think it's because we just are extremely divided as a people. But then you start looking at the sort of tax legislation and the loopholes and the, and the, you know, the last energy bill. I mean, say what you want. Democrats and Republicans are both in the trough in the transportation bill. Uh, and we're not even thinking about cutting those programs to fund uh, supporting um, uh, you know, New Orleans reconstruction. In fact, Right now, it looks like uh, the House on the one side wants to take monies out of the food stamp program right. to rebuild New Orleans, and this Repo the Democrats and Republicans, they seem to have a coalition to be able to do that. Uh, the Senate is thinking about leaning toward Medicare cuts, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Well, they want um, to take the, what I, what I heard, just to put it in balance, I heard that there's a lot of money in the food stamp program that's not being used. Right. So well, that's because we don't advertise it. it. Yeah. Use it somewhere else. That, yeah, it's not put it in the content. <laughs> yeah, but so I guess I want to separate some issues. We're partisan because we just are in a part in our history where we're deeply like pre-Civil War. It's really strongly. Uh, there's no consensus. Yeah. And there's there's other things. You start looking at the kinds of legislation that's passed, and it's just uh, obviously those guys are writing the checks and they're getting what they want. Yeah. And it's pandering to groups that have evolved to be very strongly in sure. the hearts of voters. Um, I have seen it over the years I spent in office, more and more one issue. I mean, there's a, there's a gun group out there that's all they care about is gun legislation. There's an abortion, anti-abortion group that's all they care about that issue. And, and, and then there's some people that are homophobic. You know, you can go right down the line, and so politicians, not only do they sure. pander to the check writers, they pander to a constituency out there that follows very intently and evaluates candidates on one issue. On one issue, yeah. And so, you know, that's the interesting part here, too. People, I'll say very bad things about politicians in general, but when you start getting into these camps of the one issue voter, uh, they'll say, oh yeah, I like this person immensely because they vote right on my issue. Even though I don't like any politician, I love this person 99.9% .9 of the time. And, and so when you've got that type of perception of what politicians should be doing for you, uh, and how well they're doing is based on one issue. That's another complicating factor that has evolved. Well, and that, that brings up also, the, there used to be in the Congress and in other legislatures some real party discipline. And part of that was political parties were stronger. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes we don't like that. We don't like, we don't like having, you know, say what you want about Tom DeLay, but he delivered the votes on the floor. Sometimes he had to extend voting time, but, and, <laughs> but he delivered. But, but he delivered, and there was some real party discipline. That could be good news or bad news, depending on where you are on that issue. But what happens when a candidate can raise the kind of funds independently of the party, they get awfully independent. And it's awfully tough then to find compromises mm -hmm. and consensus like you say, like you had in the 50s and the, and the 60s. Yeah. Um, and, t and television has changed that too. It allows candidates to really base, develop a base of support outside of the party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And parties have gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, to the point where, to the point, and I don't care if it's, it happens to be Tom DeLay right now because they're in power, but in the 80s it was, it was Jim Wright or somebody else. Those guys yeah, are raising yeah. so much funds in terms of their own personal personality, they're like the godfather of politics. They're writing checks out to people who need campaign well, funds. And, and just and looking Chuck for Bella. creative issues. And Chuck's the same way, right. Looking for creative issues wasn't the mode of operation. It was keeping your power, raising funds, sure. and yeah. try to be creative about something uh, yeah. didn't yeah. exist. And, 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 so, so what you want, Newt Ginrich is the first to be talking about the fact that what, this is the party that, that I supposedly helped you know, bring into being 20 years ago or 15 with his years ago. Yeah, he had creative ideas. He yeah. had a lot of good ideas. Yeah. Well, and I, and I do think that, um, that, that there are just some things that happen and it's just endemic in the, I mean, politicians are going to have to be politicians to raise money and they're going to have to please certain interest groups and so forth. 
but it just seems like the, 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 the thread is becoming undone and you know, the, the ends are fraying and, and, I, and I have some fear for, or, well, thing, or just way, look at also opportunities. I keep coming back to, we talked about episodes ago, is that most, most uh, districts aren't competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so why oh, reach yeah. consensus and reach out to the people in your district <laughs> when you know that you're a shoe in yeah. And you've got to exactly. keep those particular people happy. That's so you've got that dynamic going on as well. Yeah. Sure. Well, that's another one of those reforms. You can, not only can you reform the, the political contribution thing by controlling when those contributions are given, but you could also have a commission that now sets up the districts to try to provide some competitiveness. And Iowa so does that real well. Right. And there's some states that have taken that step, but yep. there are probably two out of 50 that right. have done that. Done it. Schwarzenegger's trying to do that in California, and he's run into resistance because sure. all their state officials Every district they ran got reelected, even though he campaigned against some of them. Yeah, well, they and still it, got yeah. reelected. And, re, and redistricting <laughs> was a real art in California. Phil Burton of mm -hmm. the Hill Burton Act. Phil Burton had so much power in California, but he was always very careful as he exercised his redistricting power to make sure that there were at least some districts that were competitive and some districts mm -hmm. that the Democrats could, that it was balanced. Mm -hmm. So that in spite of having this huge amount of power, he's a, just a fascinating political figure, having this huge amount of power that, that, he, kept, that he kept things competitive. And I think mm -hmm. understanding that if you don't do that, the whole system does fall mm -hmm. down. Yeah. Well, that's itself. the old saying. If you've got power, you, put a little, you, pee, you leave a little on the table. Mm -hmm. Leave well, a little on the table. And that's exactly the point, is that even the minority prefers the situation this way because at least they're getting reelected and they're getting funds. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, those of us who have run for groups. office, yeah. and I've said this before too, is that we're fully in favor of competitive districts and elections, but isn't it nice when you don't have an opponent? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it really <laughs> That's is. Right. Nice. We've got to wrap up and just got a, just a couple minutes left, but any bets on Peg Lautenschlager? Um, the polls came out a little more favorably than we might have thought. Uh, this woman is a scrapper. Uh, she is a hard worker, and boy, she is undaunted after the drunk driving charge, facing breast cancer, uh, and has really come back from that and is doing fairly well in the polling against two Republicans, Paul Booker, whose name is somewhat known, and Van somebody, <laughs> I apologize. Name I, is. <laughs> I can't remember that fellow's name. Van Holland, I think the name is. Will Peg win in 2006? Will she, Kathleen Falk jump into the race? Kathleen Falk, okay, I'll go right on the line. <coughs> Kathleen, Falk, Kathleen Falk uh, steps in, she's toast. Okay. If Falk doesn't, she's going to be fine. I, I, I'm surprised by, by the numbers, but then again, you know, we're not in campaign time. She's coming off of not only uh, the positives of time passage <coughs> since those acts, yes. but also the uh, conviction of the uh, first the deer hunter up in uh, right. northern Wisconsin where, where she took oh, yeah. on the, the, the right. trial. Well, we'll see. Thanks. It's been fun. <laughs>